Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Lynn O'Hara and I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day. We are thrilled to have you here either this evening or this afternoon or maybe this morning, depending on where you're watching, to kick off our 2023 contest season with our theme question and answer session. And this year is particularly exciting because we are starting a two-year birthday celebration because the 2024 contest will mark the 50th anniversary of National History Day. And that's something we're really excited about and we hope that we'll get you excited about. But our goal tonight is to not celebrate the 50th anniversary, but to give some ideas and to answer your questions about the 2023 theme. Before we begin, a few quick logistics. First off, please realize we cannot hear you and we cannot see you. So if you're finishing your dinner or your after school snack or there's background noise, don't worry about it. We don't know that. The second piece to know is that the chat box has been disabled and that is intentional because we have large numbers of students joining us live on this program. We do want to take your questions, and my colleague Kim Fortney is focusing on our question box tonight. Now, there's three different ways we can answer your questions. We already have more than 200 people joining us live, which is so exciting. That means there's going to be lots of questions. So there's a couple ways. Kim may respond to your question directly and give you an answer, especially if you're looking for something quick or where do you find something. There are some questions that she will mark and we will talk about live, especially with our guests that we have with us. And we know that we probably won't get to every question. So if you have a question, please go ahead and put it in there. Even if we don't get to it, we will go through the question log tomorrow and respond to you or potentially sometimes we have a question, we have to look up an answer. So we'll do that and get back to you within the next day or two. One quick piece, uh, please remember about digital citizenship. Everything we say and do is recorded here and everything you type into the Q&A box is recorded here. Uh, please make smart decisions and asking a question 25 times will not increase the chances of it being answered. It tends to have the opposite effect. But know that we're gonna do our best to get to as many and any and all of the questions as we can. All right, let's kick things off. Before I turn things over to our guests from the National Museum of the American Indian, the National Park Service, and the White House Historical Association, what we'd like to do is go through a couple ideas about frontiers in history. <clears throat> and what I think makes frontiers in history so interesting is that so something that makes a frontier unique is that there's something unknown when you cross a frontier. Now, it's important to understand that what's unknown for one person or group of people is not necessarily unknown to others. And if we can drive home one thing in our programming this year, we're going to strongly encourage you to look at multiple perspectives in your research. Not just the person doing the action or the group or the idea that changed, but how does it affect other groups of people, other individuals, other environments as you go? Second, we're going to encourage you to really look at missing narratives. Whose stories aren't being told or aren't being told to the same extent? And what ways can we act like sleuths in history and start to dig out some of those stories? Now, to help you, we've got some great resources. So our landing page for all things NHD theme related is nhd.org slash theme. On there, we have several things. First off, the theme book. If you haven't read it, I don't know why you haven't. It's fabulous read. It'll keep you up tonight. Um, it's freely and downloadable. And all of the resources in there are clickable. So if you see something that's exciting to you or you want to learn more, just click on it. We've also posted our theme introduction video for students. It's about 10 minutes long, and it goes through a lot of the key ideas. We also have a slightly longer video that's designed for our teachers with Dr. Kathleen Duvall, where she talks about different concepts with frontiers in history that you can use while you work with your students. All of that's posted and available at nhd.org theme. In addition to that, two of our partners have created some amazing resources. We have a whole lot more, which we'll talk about later, but there's two I want to highlight here. Uh, the team from Ken Burns Unum, as in E Pluribus Unum, have created a playlist 
where they take different clips from different documentaries and look at frontiers in science, frontiers in medicine, frontiers in the West, all kinds of different looks. So if you're, if you're a visual person, if you like to watch documentary clips and you're looking for an idea, click to this and play with some of the video clips here. Maybe this will inspire an idea. If you're a little less visual and you're someone who likes to read, we want to send you also linked on that theme book page to our friends at HistoryNet. HistoryNet creates a series of magazines, which are great secondary source material. And they have all kinds of frontiers and thought, indigenous frontiers, frontiers in the ancient world, scientific, political, uh, world frontiers, the Wild West, air and space, and they're adding to this collection every single day. So check this out if you're going, you know, I'm kind of interested in this concept, but I don't know where to go. This can also give you some ideas. On top of that, if you think you've got a topic, we have a graphic organizer that we use uh, that you can check out and download. Teachers, you can download and print this out for your students. It's also PDF fillable if you prefer to use it that way. This is kind of a good test to see if you think, your top, you think you've got a topic, see if you think it will work with the theme of frontiers. In addition to that, if you're trying to figure out where to go next, we have two resource guides we've published within the last year. The first is a teacher guide and the second is a student guide. These are free and downloadable resources at nhd.org slash library dash congress dash TPS. Working as part of the library's uh, Teaching with Primary Sources Consortium, we have developed these resources. Uh, the one with the squares on the front is for teachers, because teachers are a little square, let's be honest. And the one with the circles is directly made for students. So this can give you lots of ideas of how to access resources and use resources and primary sources to help build your NHD projects. Okay. Let's get started tonight. You didn't come to listen to me talk about resources, but we have some wonderful guests who are joining us. The first person I'd like to introduce is James Ring Adams. James works at Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, and he is going to tackle the idea of people. He's going to talk about five people in history. You may have heard of them. You may have not heard of them. But we hope that they'll give you some different ideas when you think about people. So James, Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, thanks, and I'm very glad to be there. And uh, can you see and hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, uh, I uh, wanted to talk about names that you may be very familiar with and think you know something about, but probably know next to nothing about. And I want to show you that they are, like most people, much more interesting when you begin to learn things that you don't know about them. But I'm starting with one you probably have not heard, Gudrid. Thorbjarner daughter, who is um, the first European woman to have a child in the New World. She was a co-leader of the last of the uh, great Norse expeditions to Newfoundland. And yes, the Norse were in, New in North America uh, long, long before Columbus. And um, is, uh, I think, one of the great women of history. Uh, she um, uh, not only uh, was leader of this expedition, which uh, unfortunately ran afoul of the natives and was expelled. Uh, but uh, when she went back to Iceland uh, from there, uh, made a pilgrimage to Rome, earning her the title of uh, Gudrid the Far Traveled. And uh, uh, she is um, one of the, the names uh, that has kept, uh, kept the memory of the new world, of, the, of this land mass on the other side of the Atlantic, they kept it alive through the 500 years before Columbus. Uh, her and her descendants um, were promoting her for sainthood, and uh, she is the central figure in two of the main uh, Norse sagas. The Eric the Red and uh, the Greenlanders actually are all about her. Uh, but uh, the fact that there was a land mass, as the Norse had discovered, and uh, was actually not lost in the north in in Iceland and uh, and Greenland and uh, this brings me to Christopher Columbus we think we know him as the the great discoverer of the new world uh the fact is um well he was the first really to uh, set up a uh, ongoing connection between the new world and uh and Spain and uh, 
laid the foundation for the Spanish Empire. But he knew pretty well that there was something out there uh, from all the reports that he'd been receiving. Uh, and what we uh, don't know about him, and in fact, I didn't know much about this until recently, is that uh, he was kind of a mystic uh, about, uh, about this idea. What he was really looking for uh, was a global connection uh, for Christianity. He wanted to spread Christianity uh, around the world. He thought when he uh, landed on the islands in the Caribbean, he was actually landing on the outskirts of Asia. Uh, and uh, that by bringing Christianity around the world, he would help usher in the end of times. The, uh, 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 they call it... Uh, eschatology but the, uh, the the people who think that christianity and when it is finally realized around the world is going to usher in a new age all the old sins will be uh abolished and uh, people will live in this um, uh, perennial harmony after of course a period of tribulation Th that um uh in fact when he summed up what he thought his great contribution was going to be to history it would be to spark a new crusade which would regain control of Jerusalem for Spain. Not, not uh, control of the new world, that was just a means to this final end. So there is um, uh, that streak, which is, uh, I think, kind of ignored these days in the history of uh, uh, the discovery of America and the settlement uh, and the colonization of America. Uh, but moving ahead to a person who's kind of the opposite of Columbus, uh, Captain John Smith is a very practical military leader, adventurer, and uh, I think what people don't know so much about him is it, it, that it, his life did not end with Jamestown. It didn't begin with Jamestown. He had been a soldier in the war against the Ottoman Turks and, in fact, had been captured and was a slave for a time until he was freed. Um, by a uh, a young woman uh, uh, named Trebigazanda, for whom he wanted to name a uh, part of America, but uh, actually didn't get to. So uh, he, uh, after leaving Jamestown uh, because of a, a pretty terrible accident, um, eventually found a uh, led a exploration expedition to New England and mapped New England, uh, in fact, gave the port of Plymouth its name. And it was not named by the Puritans who settled there. It was named by John Smith. Uh, and uh, in the course of uh, uh, his uh, explorations and his adventures, he met or had decisive influence on the lives of two native people that you also probably have heard of. Uh, one is Pocahontas, who's uh, we we uh, I've been very interested in her later life when she was no longer a uh, young girl cavorting in the streets of Jamestown, but was a very serious um, mother, uh, a um, wife of not of John Smith but of John Rolfe, a planter, and a crucial figure in uh, one winning peace for Jamestown because her father was Powhatan, the head of the Powhatan uh, Confederation. The uh, colonists had a, a deliberate policy to try to kidnap her and hold her as a hostage, which they did, and um, um, use uh, her pressure on Powhatan to, to arrange a peace treaty. In the course of that, uh, captivity. Uh, she was also uh, tutored in Christianity and actually converted and uh, fell in love with uh, one of her guards named John Rolfe. Uh, the the, um, the uh, romance became a kind of an international um, uh, celebrity uh, uh, when um, the Virginia Company, which was the business enterprise running Jamestown and trying to make a profit, decided to use her as basically one of the first celebrity spokesmen for a corporation and brought her to London for a um, 
a very celebrated tour where she met the king. Uh, she was fated by leading uh, uh, playwrights and all of society. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, 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 found the climate very unhealthy and, and died uh, before she returned to Virginia. But in the course of, uh, 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 I'm skipping ahead, uh, the, the other person that um, uh, John Smith in, uh, impacted more or less indirectly was the person we know as Squanto, the, the helper savior of the Plymouth colony. His name was Tisquantum. He had been kidnapped himself by one of John Smith's captains on that expedition to New England around 1615 brought back to Europe, uh, sold as a slave, somehow redeemed and found his way to London where uh, he became an advisor to um, one of the colonial enterprises, this one up in Nova Scotia, uh, Cupid's, uh, Cupid's Cove. And from there uh, managed to talk his way back to uh, the new world and his, his home village, which had at this time been decimated by disease. But one of the things that fascinates me and fascinates um, uh, a um, uh, professor, Emily Rose, who, who has written about this, is that he was in London at the same time that uh, Pocahontas, Rebecca Rolfe, was visiting London. And in fact, they were living about uh, 200 yards away from each other. Uh, uh, now, Professor Rose has written a, a very interesting piece online what would Tisquantum and Pocahontas have said to each other? And you wonder, the, your, the American natives who were in London were not uh, zombies. They were there observing, learning about Europeans and how to cope with them. And that would have been a very interesting conversation, which I hope uh, uh, some of you might want to uh, uh, imagine in, uh, in your research. But I think, is that my five minutes? Yes, thank you so much for joining us and sharing some ideas. Let's turn things now. We're going to leave uh, Washington and head out to Alaska. We're going to welcome Jolanta mm -hmm. Ryan and Grace Robbins. They work at Klondike Gold Rush National Historic Park, and they're going to take a different view. They're going to look at a place and talk about five different History Day topics that can be inspired by one place. So Jolanta and Grace, thank you for joining us. Gold, gold, gold. <laughs> We're from the Klondike Gold Rush here in Skagway, Alaska. And I'm Yolanta Ryan, and this is Grace Robbins. I wanted to quickly say that I did the National History Fair when I was in school, so I understand everyone that is a student working on their projects as well. And we're excited to talk today about some of the topics uh, that our places revolved around. Yeah. And I will start off with just a quick overview of the uh, Klondike Gold Rush. So the Gold Rush started uh, when people all over the world heard that gold was found up in the Yukon Territory of Canada. And then they stormed over to Alaska, which was the gateway to the Klondike. And people uh, brought in electricity, they built a railroad. In a matter of two years, from 1897 to 1899, the town of Dai and Skagway were built up. And so today the park maintains numerous of these historic buildings from the gold rush, as well as post gold rush buildings, along with the largest outdoor museum in the world. It's the Chilkoot Trail. I don't know if you've heard about that, but it used to be the uh, trading route for the Clinkett people and the Tagish First Nations people. And when the Stampeders came down, they used that route to go to uh, Dawson City in Canada to find the gold. So our park preserves the memory of the significant historic, historic event. And now we're going to explore some of the different perspectives of that event of the Klondike Cold Rush. And as you can see here, um, <clears throat> first I wanted to point out the Gold Rush impact on the native people. And though the primary Gold Rush story has em emphasized the story of the Stampeder, it's imperative that we focus on the people that were here first, um, and the Clinkett people in Skagway and Dai. And it's also important not to generalize how the native people reacted to the gold rush because some people saw it as an opportunity to make money. Some considered it their responsibility to help the stampeders as they went over the trail because they knew the dangers and the route um, and others didn't want the intrusion. So after the gold rush, the Clinket people did move to Skagway 
However, they were only allowed to live on the waterfront and often lived in uh, decrepit housing conditions and they had a curfew and they weren't allowed into the city center. But it is important to remember um, currently um, people are trying to keep the Tlingit culture and, and language alive. And because of this, uh, the Tlingit culture has not been destroyed and is flourishing. And I'll move on to the women. Um, yeah, so now one of the most uh, famous people to navigate the White Pass Trail, which is one of the trails uh, during the gold rush. There was the Chilkoot Trail and the White Pass Trail, but this was Harriet Pullen, and she arrived in Skagway with only seven dollars in her pocket, and she ordered her own horses to be shipped into Skagway, and she navigated her horses up the White Pass Trail during the day, and she made apple pies and sold them in the little containers made out of old tin cans at nighttime. And she opened up her own hotel and then resided in Skagway for the rest of her life. And she was one of Skagway's most distinguished citizens. And we, women came, um, I have a couple more, sorry, <laughs> um, yes, uh, ideas for that. Women came for uh, the same reason as men did to the, the gold rush. They came for opportunity, for gold, for adventure. And 10% actually of the Stampeders were women. Um, they came uh, to cater to the domestic needs of the men, as well as to be entrepreneurs. Um, and they also came to escape the, ver the very rigid Victorian society. They came as teachers, nurses, nuns, um, photographers, uh, journalists, adventurers, and gold seekers. And many were successful and some were not. Um, some came and faced challenges and they left them stranded. So many actually turned to the only commodity they had to sell in order to survive, which was themselves, which wasn't always happy, but yeah. And yeah, just wanted to end the, the all the women coming north were unique individuals and varying from various backgrounds. So now we're going to talk about the African Americans and their role in the history of Skagway and the Klondike Gold Rush Historical National Park. And one of the narratives that is lesser known that we're trying to make more visible in our parks programming is that of the Buffalo Soldiers, um, aka the Company L Regiment that came in 1899 to Skagway. They were comprised solely of African Americans, and they were there to um, enforce order in what was a disorderly town. So after the gold rush, Skagway and Diane still boom towns were full of gambling and um, misconduct and so something that would be really important that we're still trying to do in our programming is to investigate the relationship between African Americans and the white settlers in this town and how such an isolated community like Skagway and an isolated community like Dai, um, how being in that environment shapes those relationships um, being separated from the rest of the United States and um, also uh, a question to ask is um, how um, how this helps define the frontier culture that we're talking about today. And there are some resources that we have listed to do further research on Buffalo soldiers in Skagway um, and their relationships with the people there. Excellent, and I'll just mention, we're gonna post all these slides so you'll be able to access these links and these resources tomorrow. Um, and so the next uh, topic, and we have more resources here as well, and I, again, highly encourage everyone to look through them because they offer even more um, insight into what we're just barely touching on in this presentation. But the natural environment and the gold rush is actually a really fascinating and really important topic to study. Often when we think about frontiers, we think about people going in and taking over the land, and we don't really maybe think about the impacts on the environment that take place from this event. And so the same thing happened here um, as uh, the gold rush was taking off and people were flocking to the Chilkoot and the White Pass trails. Um, they'd have to face the dangers of crossing into Canada. And as we mentioned, the Chilkoot Trail was um, had been used by the Klingon tribes for hundreds of years prior and then was taken over by the white stampeders going up the trail. And so a question to ask is um, thinking about how can um, how do different people respond to the advantages advantages and disadvantages of the natural environment? Um, looking at uh, how the Klingit culture um, respected the environment and were already living in it, and how the White Stampeders came and um, tried to um, you know build towns over it and and take the reins um, as they were crossing up into Canada, and also understanding what impact does the use of natural resources have on the future of towns like uh, Skagway and Dai that. Um, only uh, survived by um, innovation um, because of how isolated Skagway and Dai were. 
And finally, our last topic that we'll talk about is technology in boomtown culture. This is another lens with which we can look at the history of the Klondike Gold Rush. As we mentioned, uh, Skagway and Day were both boomtowns, which means they were built practically overnight within a year. So um, colloquial terms there, um, but looking at how technology uh, contributed to either the survival or the decline of a town, uh, Skagway and Dai um, both had ports, but only uh, Skagway had a railroad that they built to get up into Canada. And because of that railroad, they managed to survive and continue to survive today as a town. Dai is completely a ghost town at this point. And so looking at how technology can um, can protect a town or uh, contribute to its decline uh, in such an isolated environment. And um, we have, again, more resources on these slides to do further investigation. But thinking about these topics and thinking about how a place can hold all of these topics at once throughout um, a certain time period. Um, so yeah. Great. Thank you so much. OK, let's turn things over. Remember, students, if you've got questions, raise hand isn't going to work tonight. Go ahead and go put that question in the Q&A box. We've got one more speaker, and then we're going to turn things over to these questions. So I'm going to turn things now over to Samantha Hunter Gibbs and Ken O'Regan from the White House Historical Association. And they're going to present five different ideas about uh, looking at frontiers through the White House. So thank you, Sam and Ken. All right, thank you, Lynn. Uh, greetings from the White House Historical Association here in Washington, DC. Um, so five different ideas. So here's our first one, ideas about how the president gets around. Uh, in the 19th century, transportation by horse was how the president really traveled. Uh, president Thomas Jefferson, uh, our third president, second resident of the White House, ordered construction of the first White House stable uh, and after the White House was burned by the British in 1814 during the War of 1812, James Monroe constructed another stable, uh, but Monroe's stable wasn't big enough. Um, uh, President Andrew Jackson comes along and he has many horses. He's a big horse enthusiast and great rider. He persuades Congress to fund a new neoclassical brick stable in 1834, and then subsequent White House stables come and go. Um, some are lost due to fire, including one uh, that tragically burned during the Lincoln administration, uh, and other times they had to be dismantled to make way for new government buildings. It's in 1872, during the administration of Ulysses S. Grant, who is a great horseman himself, uh, that a Victorian structure becomes the final stable in a long line of White House stables and a long line of presidents riding horses to get around. Uh, president Theodore Roosevelt was the last president to use that stable. And uh, in 1909, after Teddy's time in the White House is done, it's repurposed as an automobile, automobile garage. And in 1911, it's finally demolished, ending the era of horses as presidential transportation. Uh, talking about a different horse, the Iron Horse, railroads, that's what we call railroads, nicknamed for railroads, were used by presidents. Uh, it was President William Henry Harrison who became the first president to travel uh, by train to Washington, D.C. for his inauguration in 1841. President Abraham Lincoln expands the nation's railroad network when he signs the 1862 uh, Pacific Railway Act, which eventually leads to the completion of the first transcontinental railroad. Uh, completed in 1869 at the start of the Grant administration. It's in 1887 that President Grover Cleveland befriends an engineer named by the name of George Pullman, and he carries out a goodwill tour across the country in Pullman's elegant railroad cars. Uh, President Warren G. Harding participates in a two-month speaking tour of the western United States by railroad train, uh, and he called this the Voyage of Understanding, and he becomes the first sitting president also to visit Alaska. President Franklin D. Roosevelt used his U.S. car number one, uh, also known as the Ferdinand Magellan, for state business, for his re-election campaigns, and for personal trips. It is President William Howard Taft uh, who becomes the first president to bring cars to the White House, as we see on this slide, Taft in his white steamer. He's an automobile enthusiast. His election prompts Congress to appropriate $12,000 to purchase two motor cars uh, for the residents, and Taft's successors then increasingly utilize automobiles, and that helps propel the automobile industry forward. Of course, cars are the main mode of transportation for many people today, not just the president. And then new frontiers for transportation 
continue to be explored through the 20th century uh, by the president, including airplanes and helicopters. And exploring presidential transportation can really show how the president in the White House embraces new frontiers and also pushes scientific innovation forward and pushes forward you know, those paths of transportation for the larger American public. Uh, our next one uh, is more so thinking about the building, the White House is a building. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt has a very large family. He has six children. They move into the White House in 1901. At that time, the second floor of the White House uh, was meant to be both where the family and the president lives, also where the president's offices were. Six kids didn't work up there. Uh, First Lady Edith Roosevelt tries to make that second floor work, but she ends up hiring an architect after a year by the name of Charles F. McKim about how to make the White House work for her family. Uh, McKim comes in and says that we need to reimagine the way the White House functions and flows. He turns the second floor of the White House entirely into living space and says, we need new office space for the president. And they create a temporary executive office, which becomes the modern West Wing that we know today. Uh, so it's arguably the modern West Wing, one of the most recognizable features of the White House with housing the Oval Office. Uh, that Oval Office wasn't actually part of Teddy Roosevelt's original West Wing plan. He had a square-shaped room at the time called the President's Office or the President's Room. It's actually his successor, William Howard Taft, who brought the automobile to the White House, uh, who adds the first Oval Office, and he also expands the West Wing in 1909. And it's President Franklin D. Roosevelt who expands it even further. So it's Theodore Roosevelt and Edith Roosevelt who embark on a new frontier and challenge the way the White House works and how it functions. There's no blueprint of how to live and work in the White House, but the Roosevelts really kind of set the pace for what the presidency would become during the 20th century. And they create some of the most iconic elements in the White House. So they revolutionize, sorry, revolutionized the use of this space and they enable the presidency to enter a new modern era of function. In the rest of the 20th century, the future White House changes like a larger West Wing, more rooms. These really open up the way the presidency functions, the way the executive branch functions through the 20th century. Thanks, Ken. Hi there, everyone. So the next ideological frontier we're going to talk about is women's suffrage or the women's right to vote in the U.S. So specifically, we're talking about the silent sentinels who we see pictured on this screen. And the sentinels begin picketing the White House in January of 1917. And this is really the first organized public protest at the White House. Now, their goal was to shame President Wilson for his inaction on suffrage, even after years of demonstrations and meetings with suffragist leaders and support. Orders. Now, over time, the protesters started being fined, and then eventually they were even imprisoned for their demonstrations in front of the White House. And while they were in prison, they experienced some pretty harsh treatment by their guards. And then some newspaper articles come out that kind of detail these abuses. And ultimately, those details are what put Wilson over the edge, and he um, pardons the suffragists that have been in prison for protesting at the White House. Now, even though Wilson was initially unwilling to throw his support behind the cause, in December of 1917, he does advocate for women's suffrage in his inaugural address to Congress. But suffragists continued to publicly demonstrate. They even burned speeches in which Wilson mentioned freedom and democracy because they thought it was hypocritical of him to mention those ideas, but not really supporting suffrage. But thanks to a lot of their work, in the spring of 1919, the 19th Amendment, or the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, passed the House and the Senate. But in order to become a law, 36 states needed to ratify the amendment. And that happens in August of 1920, when Tennessee becomes the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Now, while some of the suffragist tactics were considered pretty radical for the time, the suffragists persevered by demonstrating their willingness to fight for equality. Their struggles gave momentum to the movement and opened new frontiers in public demonstration near the White House. No doubt that these actions inspired later demonstrations about civil rights, the Vietnam War, and even environmental protests today. You could also argue that the actions of women suffragists opened new frontiers in the history of civil rights in America and new frontiers for women in the U.S. We know that the 19th Amendment largely impacted white American women because the 19th Amendment says that people can't be prohibited from voting because of their gender. However, they could be stopped from voting for other reasons like their race or their citizenship status. So what you know would still be needed there to expand voting access on these grounds? Those are just some ideas to show you that, you know, there's endless frontiers to be explored here. 
Another frontier we can take a look at, and I saw this is an interesting one based on some of the chat comments, uh, is space, the final frontier. So at the end of the Second World War, we move into the Cold War, and that's where the space race really kind of blossoms from. Puts the United States and the Soviet Union in a competition of who could get to space first, and then eventually who could get to the moon first. So with strong leadership and a lot of inspiration from the White House, Americans turn their attention towards space as this final frontier. It's in 1957 that the Soviets launched the first man-made satellite into orbit, Sputnik 1, and this causes President Eisenhower to build up the U.S. space program. He establishes NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and increases funding for the sciences in schools uh, to kind of propel the country um, into the space race. From then on, America is launching its own rockets, its own satellites, uh, eventually puts its own astronauts in space, and eventually wins, wins the space race by putting a man on the moon. Uh, this is all done during the administrations of President John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, and eventually Richard Nixon. It's in 1975 under President Ford that the United States and the Soviet Union actually stopped competing with each other in space and they joined forces for what is called the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project. That's a picture that you see here. You see President Ford of the astronauts from both countries. Uh, so despite these Cold War tensions, these two rival nations uh, put their grievances aside and worked together in the pursuit of scientific knowledge to better the human race as a whole. Uh, and on July, uh, July 15th, 1975, the Kremlin completed the first joint international space flight when their spacecrafts met uh, in space. And then in 1998, the US and Russia, several other countries came together to build the International Space Station. So the White House remains at the center of the American space effort and space exploration. And presidents remain attentive to not just NASA projects, but also the growing private space industry and the promotion of cooperative international missions to advance uh, technological knowledge and space exploration. Okay, so I'll wrap up our portion of the presentation here with an idea in international frontiers um, from the White House. So we're going to talk about President Nixon's historic visit to China in 1972 and how that opened a new international frontier and established important foreign policy for the United States. Now, prior to Nixon's visit in 1972, the U.S. and China did not have friendly diplomatic relations. Communists in China established the People's Republic of China, or the PRC, in 1949 after a long civil war in which they defeated the U.S.-backed capitalist government. And after defeat, the U.S.-backed government established itself in Taiwan. And at that point, the U.S. recognized Taiwan's government, excuse me, government and did not recognize PRC and even shut them out of the U.N., so throughout the 1950s and 60s, communist leader of PRC Mao Zedong implemented harsh policies that ultimately hurt their relations with the Soviet Union, their former ally. So this fact of kind of, you know, breaking off um, friendly relations with the Soviet Union and the United States desire to pull out of the war in Vietnam provided an opening for the U.S. and China to establish some diplomatic relations and work together. And this is really what prompts Nixon's visit. Now, during the visit, Nixon attended meetings and banquets. First Lady Pat Nixon visited schools and hospitals. And as you see in this image here, the president and first lady visited cultural attractions throughout the country, including the Great Wall. Now, when you research this um, topic, you'll see that this is often described as the week that changed the world. To formalize these new diplomatic alliances, excuse me, alliances, the U.S. had to revoke its recognition of Taiwan, and in establishing relations with the People's Republic of China, the U.S. essentially endorsed China's opening to the world. Now, eventually, China gains a seat in the United Nations and becomes an influential world and economic power, and China and the U.S. through this visit embarked on a new international frontier together as a result of Nixon's visit. So, you know, this is obviously just a quick overview of five topics within White House history, but there's so much more. You'll see that the image here on the screen is credited to our digital library. We encourage you to check that out. There's lots of great content there, as well as our National History Day resource page, where we've got many, many more ideas that we hope some students will pursue this year. All right. Well, thank you all so much. We've got lots of good ideas that have come out of our presenters. And I know that there's lots of good questions hanging in that question box. So I'm going to ask Kim to come on and share some questions, whether they're for me or have all our presenters turn their cameras on, because I'm sure there are questions for you mixed in here or ones that you can help us answer. So Kim, go ahead and unmute yourself. We'd love to hear it. 
Yes, this is so much fun. We have a lot of really great, great questions, questions coming from students, from teachers. Thank you all for your questions. I don't know that we're going to get to all of them, but there are a number that have to do with topic choices. So I thought I would ask some of these. Um, are there rules about certain topics that you can or cannot do? Ah, that's a great NHD question. At NHD, we do not set guidelines or requirements for topics. Students choose topics and they need to be approved by two people, your teacher, if you're doing this for a school or class project, and your parent or guardian. Now, that being said, teachers need to set parameters in their classroom. So if you are in an ancient history class, your teacher may say you need to choose an ancient history topic, and that is totally within their rights. Uh, your teachers and parents have the final say, not us. Please don't email us. It happens every year. It's not a good idea. We can't help you. Um, but there are no parameters. There's no requirements and there's no preferences. We have seen lots of great projects from very, very ancient to very modern history and anything and everything you can possibly imagine. Honestly, it's much more about good research than it is about the topic. That good research makes a good project. Mm -hmm. That's great, Lynn. In your answer, you answered a couple of other questions about does it just have to be U.S. history or can it be lots of other possibilities, regional, local, world history, et cetera. So thank you for that. Um, we had a lot of questions that were basically asking, are some topics going to give you a better odds or chance of, of winning the contest? There are no odds on the contest. <laughs> and honestly, I, I want to actually ask Sam and Ken to speak to this. I know you have both been judges at different levels of the contest. Can you explain what makes a good project or what's, what makes a project do better than another project? Because I'm going to get a sneaking submission. It's not about the topic. Absolutely, Lynn. Um, you're right. It is not about the topic. I've had, you know, oppor or chances where I've, you know, judged and I've seen the project up you know, many projects on the same topic. And, you know, each one is different because of what they bring to the table. I think a good project has multiple perspectives, which Lynn mentioned in the beginning. We want to hear, you know, who's missing, you know, whose voice wasn't recorded as prominently in history alongside, you know, whatever that main narrative is that we might know about the topic. I think that's really important. I also love to see great use of primary sources. It's so easy to find so many secondary resources out there, but if you can really sit with the primary sources and tell us how it informed your research, I think that makes it a great project. What about you, Ken? I, the multiple perspectives is really what does it for me. That That's what takes a pretty good project to being a great project is being able to acknowledge the different perspectives um, that you can approach with a topic like that. So that's definitely what I'm always, one of the biggest things that I'm looking for when I'm judging a project is, you know, are you covering your bases when you're discussing this project or well, this I topic? I think it's really important for our students to understand you don't have to agree with a perspective to include it. You know, if if there there for every law or every case there were those who supported it, there are those who opposed it. And understanding why the opposition happened is important. Even if you disagree with it, it's important to include that perspective as part of your research. Because as historians, we can't just skip the parts we don't like. It doesn't quite work that way. Mm -hmm. All right, I have a few questions from students asking, can they use any of the topics that were brought up tonight by our wonderful presenters? Sure, but <laughs> honestly, you're not limited to anything you saw tonight. Our goal was to give you a taste and a flavor and some different options, but we know that there are tons of people, literally thousands of people in history with amazing stories. We know that there, every place, every community, every city has a story, every national park has a story. We also know that there are frontiers in ideas and that's ideas in politics, in social, in society, in science, in medicine, in literature, in art, in music. So I'll let you in on a little history day secret. Almost any topic fits almost any theme, but the trick is to do the research and to figure out the connection. 
it's not always obvious at first. And sometimes I've seen some projects where I go, I don't know how that one works, but then I'll watch it or listen to it. And I go, oh, that's a really interesting connection. Or I see this topic, which I thought I knew, but I see it in a different way because of that student's perspective and the evidence that they brought to the table. A number of students are asking, where can I find primary sources about my topic? And many are asking specific questions about their topic and where might we suggest they go to for, for, for primary sources? So Lynn, what would you like to say about that? Oh, there's so many different ones, but I actually like to turn these questions to some of our presenters. Um, could I ask the team from Skagway to talk a little bit about where you go to find resources and where you went to find some of the resources that you have linked. So what resources exist within the National Park Service or maybe the Postal Museum or other locations that are some of your favorites for doing research? Um, so about uh, the primary sources at the Klondike Gold Rush National Historical Park, we have our own archives. And that is where we have a lot of primary sources and in any topic, archives is going to be an excellent resource for primary research. And so um, the way that you can get in contact is we have um, our own curator slash librarian and people will submit research requests. There's like a specific form and you can find it online at, I believe on our park website um, or you can always contact us later and we can find out that out. Sometimes it gets tricky um, and you can submit research requests um, to find primary sources on a specific topic as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. James, can I ask you when students are researching Native Nations topics, can you talk about some resources from the National Museum of the American Indian or other Smithsonian institutions that might be helpful, especially if they're trying to tell that perspective of Native Americans? Well, uh, that's a broad question, and there are a lot of resources. I think we do have a library, and uh, we help with research questions. Um, uh, I would, uh, if you're doing a specific tribe, I, I would direct people to the tribal archives, to the tribal librarians. Uh, there's a lot of activity now developing uh, archival and uh, library skills among the tribes. And uh, I think they'd be more than happy to to help share their stories. Uh, I, um, uh, but, but but that's a starting place. And um, uh, go to the library. And um, uh, even uh, online, uh, you'll find um, a, a lot of uh, sites that do specialize in uh, collecting tribal histories. Uh, uh, they will... Um, give you a good leads and uh, 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 start you on a good path. Absolutely. And I'll also throw, we'll, we'll add the link to our follow-up email for uh, a link called Native Knowledge 360, which has lots of great information that the Smithsonian has developed for students and teachers looking at these topics and also could give you some amazing topic ideas. Right. I should plug that because that's my, uh, <laughs> another division of my, uh, uh, my operate of my uh, uh, employer. Yeah. Absolutely. Lynn, can I jump in with my favorite tip there? Please. <laughs> when If you're starting with your secondary source research or whenever you're looking at your secondary sources, look at the footnotes and the endnotes to see what primary sources historians are citing. That will send you on the right path. Absolutely. And save you a lot of research time as well. Uh, Ken, could I ask you to jump in to talk about the library you have at White House Historical and other places if you're looking at political history topics? Yeah, so at the White House Historical Association, uh, we have a digital library and that contains a lot of primaries. There's a lot of images um, really, but also some documents, but we have something like 30 or 40,000 sources in there now. Um, and that's completely free to use. You'll find a link to it on our website. You can sign up. When you do sign up and it sends you the confirmation, check your spam folder because it has a bad habit of ending up there. Um, but if you can't find what you're looking for there, um, or in other places on our way on our website, whitehousehistory.org. Um, you know, go for it. Go for the National Archives. Go for the Library of Congress. Don't be afraid to to from your web browser to go searching on those things. I mean, th there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of primary sources out there um, on those two on those two sites, and they're easy to find. They're easy to use. Um, if you know what you're searching for. I'm also going to throw out one idea. You know, we think about the National Archives of the United States or the Library of Congress. But it's important to remember that 
every country has its own national archive. So when you're looking at topics outside of the United States, look at their national archives. One of the things that's really been, I guess, a, a positive of some of the challenges of the last two and a half years is that many institutions have kind of doubled down on digitization and said, okay, if we can't bring visitors through our doors, what can we digitize? What can we share? There's been a lot of online programming where organizations have said, okay, let's see how we can tell our story or share our museum virtually with visitors. And feel free to look at those because those can really give you some good ideas and help help lead you to some interesting primary sources, secondary sources, or perspectives that maybe you didn't think of when you started your research. I have a couple more questions. So students are asking, do they have to talk about people, places, and things? Ah, there's no and in the topic. Now, as a general rule, we always tell students don't ignore. So don't just talk about a person and skip the fact that the person really changed an idea or it was a person rooted in a particular place. Let the story lead you. But generally you will find that there's elements of two or sometimes even three in your topic. But we want you to let the story drive it and see where your argument goes. It's one of the fallacies or challenges of going into historical research is going in with the end in mind, right? I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna prove this argument. Well, as a general rule, if you do that, you'll probably find some sources, but it's really not good history. It's best to go in with a topic to do the research and then figure out your argument about the frontier. Don't go the other way around. It doesn't tend to work out well. And honestly, it usually sounds pretty forced in the end. Mm -hmm. And in a related question, what about current topics like a frontier about cryptocurrency? Ah, yes. The great question of what makes history history, right? When does a moment become history? The key with current events, current events are where a lot of students start with ideas. And that's great. I love that you have interest in current events and what's going on in the world around us. But for current topics, things that are going on right now or in the past few years, we know the short-term impacts, but we don't always know the long-term impacts. And history has to know what happens in the long run, not just the short run. So things that happened this year, this month, or quite frankly, even in the last five to 10 years, we just don't know enough to be able to answer that question. Access a way to look at it is the historians haven't had time to write the articles and write the books to help us. The good rule of thumb that we use in history, and this is a rule of thumb, not a rule, is that History Day project should be about 20 to 25 years old in order to give us the time to process it and to see those long-term impacts. Now, if you have questions about that though, talk to your teachers, talk to your librarians, because they're the ones ultimately who are gonna say, yeah, let's go with that topic or, well, you know, here's the questions we still don't have the answers to. Mm -hmm. All right, here's an oldie but a goodie. Are interviews required for a History Day project? Ah, uh, no, they're not. <laughs> Honestly, sometimes interviews can be really appropriate, right? Sometimes, especially if you're writing, creating a project on your family's history, and something that ties into someone who's still alive or was there, that can be appropriate, but oftentimes it's not. It's kind of a history day myth. And I've seen it, you have to have three interviews to win. No, you don't. Um, and oftentimes, so we have, if you go to nhd.org slash interviews, we have some guidelines and suggestions. We talk about what's the difference between an oral history and an interview. We also talk about the fact that there are thousands of hours of recorded both audio and video oral histories that can be amazing primary sources that you know we may not necessarily connect conduct the interview on your own um, and as i'm thinking of things like uh, the veterans history project at the library of congress there's some amazing content there i'm thinking of some oral histories particularly within native cultures that have been recorded and that have been posted on different websites for different museums or native nations those can be great sources but no it's required that students have sources and required that students have an annotated bibliography 
But what goes into that, quite frankly, varies dramatically based on your topic, right? Some topics have a lot more sources than others. Doesn't necessarily make them a better topic. It just depends. Once again, you've answered lots of questions with that answer. So thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, a question about how contests work. So if I'm submitting a junior group exhibit, who am I competing against? Oh, that's a great question. So we have two divisions that compete. So our junior division is students in grades six, seven, and eight. And our senior division is high school students, nine, 10, 11, 12. Most students start by sending their project to a regional contest. Now, if you go to nhd.org slash affiliates, that will connect you with your affiliate coordinator. That person is in charge of your affiliate. For most people, that will be a state. However, we also have programs in Washington, D.C., in American Samoa, in Guam, in the Northern Mariana Islands, in Department of Defense schools, in Puerto Rico, and in Cuba. And they will help let you know where your first level contest is. So for most people, it's a region. And depending on where you live, that region might be two or three counties. It might be a little larger. It might be a little smaller. And in some state students go directly to that affiliate or state contest. So check with those coordinators. When you go, you will put your project up, let's say you're a junior group exhibit and you will compete with other junior group exhibits. So other middle school exhibits from your region. Those students might be from the same school that you go to. They might be from other schools in the area. They might be, and honestly, we work with every kind of school, right? Public, private, parochial, charter, homeschool, online. Doesn't matter if you're in those grades, we'd love to have you come join us. Uh, you compete your project. If you do well, you might advance up to the next level. For most people, that's your state or affiliate contest. And if you do really well, if you place one or two, you'll have the opportunity to come to the national contest next June in College Park, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And we will be in person next year. We are very excited to be back in person next year. Do we have time for one more question? Let's do one more and then we will put up the feedback form. So I know there's students who need to get extra credit for coming. We'll give you the form. It will email you a copy of your responses and you can bring that to your teacher tomorrow. Also, teachers, if you're here, bring that to your principal tomorrow. See if you can get an hour of professional development credit. Excellent. So go ahead, Kim, what's our last question? And again, if we didn't get to yours, we'll try to go through them tomorrow and get to the rest of them. Well, the last question is a great one about how to frame your project. So a student is asking, are they supposed to be trying to argue something or, or simply just present the information they find? Ah, this is the exciting part about what makes history history, right? The difference between history and an encyclopedia article, encyclopedia articles are facts, right? This person was born, this is what they did, this is where they died, this is where they're buried. That's kind of a, a linear story. In history, we make an argument. And the key to the argument is the history day theme. Our themes are designed to help you construct a historical argument, to make a case about how a person crossed a frontier and why it mattered, why a new idea in a particular field changed history or changed that discipline, or how a place changed or was changed by the people and their stories. I think it's important to remember that frontiers don't always go one way and they often go into different dimensions. Sometimes we think we know what's going to happen, but what happens is very different. And what is a short-term consequence isn't even a long-term consequence. And a lot of times you'll hear your teacher say, well, so what? So this thing happened in history, why does it matter? And when you can start to argue why it matters, you're at the start of an argument. And yes, we want you to construct a historical argument. But honestly, we're only at the end of September. You're probably not there yet. You can't create that argument till you've got some research under your belt and you've done some digging. You've read some books and some articles. You've analyzed some primary sources and you've talked about them, maybe with other students in your group or classmates. And then you can start to build that argument. All right, I've been getting a lot of the questions. Is there any other last thoughts our other presenters would like to add before we go to our final slide? All right. 
we'll go ahead and go to that. What we have here in order to get your professional development or class extra credit, you can either go to tinyurl.com slash nhdtheme23, or you can use your cell phone and use the handy QR code. Go ahead and fill out our feedback form. We'll get a copy of it you'll get a copy of it and you can take that email. Now you have to put in a real email address or it's not gonna email to you. We can't know who you are, but it will go ahead and send you a copy of your feedback form that you can turn in either to your principal or to your teacher tomorrow. At this point, we're gonna leave this up for a minute, but I wanna say a huge thank you to James Ring from the National Museum of the American Indian, Yolanta Ryan and Grace Robbins from the National Park Service in Skagway, Alaska, and Samantha Hunter Gibbs and Ken O'Regan from the White House Historical Association. Um, we appreciate all of your time and energy. We love your questions. Students, best wishes. We cannot wait to see your projects. Many of the panelists you see, keep an eye out. You never know. They might be a judge at your affiliate regional or national contest. And sometimes they might show up in multiple places. Our judges tend to do that. So we hope that we've inspired you. We've given you some ideas and some resources. We will post all of these resources and the video to this program at nhd.org slash theme. Give us a couple hours. We'll get it on, but we'll get it up there along with slides and links and resources. So at this point, I'm going ahead and I'm going to stop our recording here.